we're back. Another week, another episode of the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I'm your host, John Dayton, and with me here today, uh, remotely, is my friend Kevin Brushert, who is coming in. Uh, the mo- are you in Nashville at the moment, or are you in South Carolina? No, I'm in Nashville. Right okay, now. so he's he, uh, he just went through a move in his life. Uh, the reason we're talking to Kevin today is uh, he is the... Uh, Owner and one half of the productions at Viking Recordings or Viking Studio. What was the actual title of it? Viking Productions. Viking Productions. That's why I had trouble finding it on the internet. Um, but anyway, Kevin moved down to Nashville a few years ago. He actually started out. Uh, Viking Productions was. There's a little bit of a tie-in here to podcast number two, I think it was. Uh, Brian Moore that we talked to. Uh, Kevin was working in a studio in Medina and sold it off to Brian so that he could move down to Nashville, and then Brian. Took that studio, uh, changed the name, eventually moved it a couple of times, and so there's there's that little bit of a family connection there. It's a, a small, small world, yep. the audio world. Um, well, at any rate, uh, Kevin, uh, and I'll let him kind of get into the description a little more about the, the type of work he does, the type of clients he has. But um, he uh, he made that move. He uprooted his family. He's got a, you know, a, a wife and a, a home life and some short people that look up to him, and he picked them all up and headed off to a big population center, which is sort of the opposite of what I did. I uh, <laughs> I was really attached to my hometown, so I stayed here and kind of made my uh, my work fit around my lifestyle and found what work I could. And uh, Kevin was one of the courageous ones who went out into the world and, and set himself up in actually a, a pretty demanding locale. I mean, you think of you know, New York and L.A. as being these big centers, but Nashville is just a huge, huge center for not just musicians and not just country musicians, but, you know, there's a huge recording industry there. So uh, it can be pretty tough to be a small fish in such a big pond. So we'll get all into all of that stuff a little bit later. Um, I want to turn it over to Kevin here now and let him just kind of give you a little description about what his operation is like. Uh, why don't you start out with, uh, like, you and your partner and then give us a little bit of, uh, you know, what your, your setup is like, your rooms and your gear. Well, it's uh, it's been kind of a, a journey, obviously, since we we left New York, um, which it's been it's been a good five six years since I was in New York in Medina, and so uh, the setups definitely changed a lot since then, and and the way that the business is even kind of configured has changed a lot. I uh, I have a studio right now in Nashville, Tennessee. It's Viking Productions is the name of the 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 business, and you can find us online. Our, our website is uh, wearevikings dot com. Um, and it has a little bit of uh, what we're about there, but uh, you know, I have a, a business partner who is also a, a producer and engineer in his own right, and we've been working together for about four years here in Nashville, um, co-producing and doing some different artist development type things here. Um, uh, our room currently, our room is is actually pretty simple. We have a, a, a simple Pro Tools LE type system with an iMac and um, some key dynamics processing and uh outboard mic pre's and some microphones and things like that um and so we can get into some of the specifics of that um as as we kind of continue talking but but that's kind of our situation right now um you know we we kind of i guess to give you a little bit of history on on viking productions here in nashville is um you know i i had done production work on my own for several years um independently in new york and and um, actually had a, a short uh, stint in uh, uh, Virginia before coming to Nashville and um, freelancing, doing live sound, doing um, production engineering, uh, a whole bunch of different things. And when I was in Nashville, um, I really I really felt strongly about wanting to get into collaborative um, work, um, both with artists, but then also just on the on the engineering and production side. And so um I actually threw a Craigslist ad. I, I I met Brandon Purdue, who is my 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 partner in Viking, and uh, he was doing some production work on his own that I was really really into. And so we started getting together, having coffee, talking about well, what is production? What is this whole thing all about? And what does it mean to really collaborate? And getting back to kind of the roots of of production and the roots of of why people you know, record music and why, why producers are even needed. And we kind of started t- looking at like older records, you know, with, the, with the Beatles and, and, and George Martin and just kind of coming alongside the vision of the artist and then trying the producer's role being helping that vision to kind of come together. Um, and so just exploring that. And so out of those conversations, we just started kind of talking about, 
hey, maybe we should co-produce some things together and maybe we should work on some projects together. And, and so we, uh, we did and um, we started working on a, a, a solo artist named Jesse Anderson um, and then another a group from New Zealand called the Ember Days. And uh, we, we really, uh, I think through those two projects, we really started to kind of realize that there was a benefit to working together um, and, and being able to kind of collaborate and, and work through a lot of those. Um, I mean, it's definitely a little bit more of a challenging process, but I think that it's been, it's been really good for us. We've all, we've both learned a whole lot, um, working together. Um, and I think we've, I think we're a lot happier with the products that we put out since we've been working together as well. So. Yeah, it can definitely take the pressure off. Uh, even if it's not the case, I mean, even if, if the, the project you're working on is totally out of the wheelhouse of the guy you're sitting next to. Just to know that there's another brain and set of ears and eyes in the room can uh, sort of relieve you because it, it's weird. I, I, I know you've worked on stuff by yourself where it gets late and you get tired and you, just, you start to tell yourself things or you talk yourself into things or out of things. And, uh, I mean, of, of all the stuff in your studio, I mean, sometimes the guy sitting next to you is just the most valuable thing of all. Yeah, so, no, for sure. And and that was actually one of the things that was great working on those first couple projects is the space that we were in at the time was a lot bigger than the one we're in now. And we actually had two control rooms. And so we were able to kind of, you know, double team things like he could be working on, um, you know, doing some vocals in one room and I was working on some bass and guitar overdubs in another room. And, you know, you get to that place where you hit the wall and you're like, man, I don't have any perspective on what's happening here. And you just <laughs> kind of walk down the hall and you're like, hey, can you take a listen to this or you just walk down the hall and you hear what the other person's working on and you get really inspired and it kind of pumps you up and gets you excited again about, about what you're doing. And it gives you some perspective that you didn't have before. Amazing. And, uh, and uh, the other thing I just wanted to say that was really cool was that, uh, you know, you talked a little bit and we'll get into this more later about doing artist development, which seems like one of those things that's kind of going away in the industry. I and mean, it used to be, you know, the A and R guys would go out and find somebody with potential and sign them to a multi multi record deal, you know, five, six, seven, eight records. And the first two, and yeah, maybe they hit, but if they didn't, it wasn't a big deal. It was back catalog and it was a development process of putting them together with songwriters, engineers, producers, and de- really developing them as, you know, that's what the D and A, or actually, I got that wrong. Right? <laughs> like the, the development has kind of um, fallen by the wayside. I mean, with production gear as cheap and as good as it is, you know, there isn't any making a four track tape demo and taking it in and then going to the studio to do a real one. It's, you know, if you're in a local band and you're making some tracks in your basement, if your band's good and, you, and your buddy that recorded you is kind of good, that's it. Like you can, you could hand in the stems and, and, you know, have it professionally mixed by the labels guy and, and off it goes. So like to, to an extent, like there's not the demo anymore. Like when you're working on stuff, you're working on the stuff. Um, so really cool that uh, you know Brian does this too at his studio. When somebody comes in to work with him, they, uh, you know, they're not just looking at him as the guy who gets the stuff on the hard drive. Uh, you know, he they're really looking to collaborate with him artistically, and I, I just think that's such a cool thing, and that it can go on at, at such a small scale and be so affordable to people that you know it's the the days of these you know towering monolithic record companies and uh, you know the fact that it can just it can be a guy with a laptop and if he's good then the stuff that he turns out is just as valid as anything that comes came comes out of or has ever come out of a, a major studio anywhere. Uh, so moving on, I wanted to ask you, I mentioned this a little bit in the intro, uh, how is it trying to jump in and swim in the big old Nashville pond? It's really good. Um, I actually am really glad. I think it was probably one of the best things that I could ever have done in my career as a producer and an engineer. Um you know, just to, to even expound a little bit more on my history, you know, I got into recording and producing, um, I think I was about 19 years old and I was in a band, of course. I think that's kind of a lot of people I talk to. It's kind of their story. I think Brian's story is real similar. It's, you know, I was in a band and wanted to record my band and I didn't know how, and it was the nineties and nobody really knew anything about recording like they do today. And so, um, I ended up finding a guy who had a studio in his house and started hanging out with him asking them questions about how, you know, a compressor works and how, like, um, how to set up a microphone, you know, just real simple things. But through asking that stuff, I was able to kind of figure out how to record my band. And and then I even learned more stuff that I wasn't even really looking to learn, um, just about how the studio environment works and different people's roles in it and things like that. And, um, 
through that hands-on experience, I think I was able to kind of um, secure an internship at a commercial studio um, that was in Buffalo. And then out of that was able to get hired by a commercial studio in Buffalo um, and do um, some, some uh, assisting engineering work like that. Um, and then out of that, I uh, ended up kind of getting into buying some of my own equipment and building my own studio. And this was all in kind of rural areas of upstate New York, um, working with local bands and, and trying to um, kind of, I guess, just basically assisting the, the local music scene. Um, I think small town, uh, at least in, in probably the last decade, there were a lot of local bands and, and, and um, a lot of really cool creative things going on in the area that we were in. And so it was, it was really fun to, to kind of be part of that and to be able to help bands kind of find their sound. And I definitely learned a lot about how to produce and producing and, and techniques and, and different, um, different approaches. Um, a lot of the producers that I had worked with, um, when I was coming through like the internship and the assisting engineering process at the recording studio, I did kind of find that a lot of them were sort of egomaniacal like in their <laughs> approaches, like as far as just, just kind of hoarding the power and being the guy who has the authority and making sure that everyone in the room realized that they were the producer and things like that. And, and, and that was almost a turnoff for me. And, and, and it kind of rubbed off on me for a little bit because I felt like, well, maybe that's what I need to be. Maybe I need to be the heavy. <laughs> and, 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 and so for a few years, I think I, I probably did more damage than good on a lot of projects that I worked on just because I had a poor perspective on that. And, and, but, but, you know, you learn, you live in, and, and you kind of, uh, you grow and you mature and you start to realize that, you know, it's, it's just like, I mean, it's a service industry. It's just like any service industry. You just treat people well and, 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 and you try to do your best to serve them. And I think that, um, I think, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time to learn that. And, and especially in an entire, in an artistic environment, like, like a recording studio, because the needs are different every time. Everybody has a different need and everybody has a different, um, goal personally. And so, so you start learning those things and you learn how to meet those needs and, and serve people. Um, and so you, you end up getting better at it, but, but, but getting back to, to, to the question, um, I think that, um, I think being in Nashville has been really good because in New York, I had really hit kind of the glass ceiling of, of, of as far as I, I think I was going to be able to take things and establishing, myself in that area. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I, I, it's really weird because I was in my late twenties and I was, I, I was starting to have kids and I had a family and it was like, you know, it, it wasn't this like rock and roll lifestyle thing, you know, anymore. It was sort of like, okay, this is actually a career. This is a job. I got to kind of figure this thing out. And then combine that with the fact that I had kind of hit the top of whatever I was going to do. I was definitely the bigger fish in the small pond in New York, you know? And, um, and when he says New York, like just to dispel, dispel the thing, the image you're getting in your mind, we were where we lived was about as far removed from New York City as you can get without falling in one of the Great Lakes. Like it would yeah. be, it's it's way easier to get to Canada from where we were than it was to get to New York City. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, up, uh, definitely upstate Western New York State, um, you know, rural New York, I guess you would call it, but um. But, you know, being in an area where, where I had hit the ceiling and then being in an area of, of transition in my life where it was like I was having kids and like trying to figure things out, um, you know, through a different process. You know, I went to Virginia for a little bit and kind of tried working in a church for a little bit and 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 that wasn't really the right timing and, and some different circumstances kind of led me to Nashville. And I was very reluctant, very reluctant to move to Nashville. I actually kind of, I always joke and I, I kind of came to Nashville kicking and screaming <laughs> because, you know, I, 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 I had had some weird experiences here before when I was in a band and I had a small record label and was trying to showcase artists and it had just put a bad taste in my mouth for Nashville. And so coming to Nashville, I was very skeptical and, and sort of, not really as into it as, as most people are when they come here. Um, but it has ended up turning out to be really great. Um, Nashville is a lot different than other music um, centers like LA or New York city. Um, Nashville is, it's a Southern, it's a Southern city. There's a lot of community here. It's a very family friendly city. 
which is really different for a creative city like it is. Um, and so we've really learned to love my, me and my family have learned to really love living here. Um, and, and have really, um, kind of allowed ourselves to become part of that community. And that's been really great. And as far as the, uh, the work, I mean, there are so many great engineers, producers, artists, musicians, like people who I would consider are at the top of, of their field um, are right. I mean, even right in this building, right down the hall from us, you know, I mean, there are some people who, who I, I have so much respect for and so much, there's so much to learn here and it's a very open community here. People are very willing to kind of uh, um, join in, in, in community and share ideas and to, to share techniques and even let you uh, borrow equipment. And, and so, so it's a, it's a, it's a city, but it has a town feel, you know, it, it doesn't feel like a big city. It feels very accessible. And, and it's just crazy because you're in this, big town filled with people who are just really amazing at what they do. And and so for me, moving to Nashville has been great because I've been able to learn so much uh, about my trade and, and, and it's really driven me and challenged me to get better at my trade um, and uh, get better at what I do. And so, so I would say that Nashville, it was a great, it was a great decision and it's been a great community be, to be a part of. That's awesome. Cool to hear that you were able to, to find a niche and climb in. And that was the thing that really stifled me being where I was. Is, you know, periodically I would, you know, take on something new and challenging. And then two or three years later, I'd be like, well, did everything there was to do in that genre. <laughs> and, you know, whether it was, you know, going from bars to clubs or into theater and different sizes, you know, it would, it was great. You know, I have this huge period of, you know, explosive growth and learning. And then it would just get so I had every gig in my back pocket and I would get really stagnant. And then fortunately, periodically things would come in. And, you know, my latest job has been that for me, like uh, stepping into a, a larger church and having to really, you know, put the rubber on the road and, and make it squeal. Uh, having to learn some stuff pretty quick and on the fly. And uh, since I started here, my head has just been exploding with audio. And I, I think that's kind of similar to, to Kevin sort of finding his right spot to be in is uh, when you're around people, even if they're not audio people like i just i sit in an office with people who are amazingly creative and driven and nice to boot and so that's just that kicks me in the butt every single day i, I come in whistling a tune and i leave whistling a tune so um there are definitely there you know trials and tribulations in this line of work whatever branch you go into and uh also really nice that you know that nashville is such a nice place for your family to live because uh you know the type of lives that guys like us lead is already really hard on your family you're gone all hours of the day and night and you know holidays and birthdays and uh you know the the client is really pretty much king i mean unless you're really lucky and you're able to kind of dictate but you know the, the bigger you get the more time you got to spend uh so anyway just cool um want to get into uh <coughs> excuse me um what kind of work do you do with a client um you know, long before you ever come in and set up mics and press record, what's the prep process like for you? Well, I would say that, um, I mean, any production probably would, would start with the, with the actual song itself, which I actually think is probably the same answer that, that Brian gave to you a few podcasts back. Um, I mean, if you don't have a good song, it's going to be really hard to have a good production and good engineering because, because I think that anything presents well when you have a, a good song. And so I would say that, that the process probably starts with listening, listening to the material that you're about to record, um, listening to um, the presentation, the arrangement, um, kind of meeting with the artist and finding out what their expectations are, finding out what their vision is for the project. And then, um, and then just trying to, yeah, just trying to figure out, going back to the service industry thing, you know, just trying to figure out how to best serve the artist and the song. Um, and if there are issues with the song, it's easier to deal with them at the front end than to deal with them in midstream, you know. And so um, so usually what we would do is we would ask for demos. And, and a demo can be just like something that you play into your iMac speakers or just, a, you know, a real simple acoustic and vocal uh, of, of the songs and then taking that and then maybe making a chart um, 
talking through the arrangement, how they want to perform it. If there's going to be studio musicians, what would the instrumentation be that they're looking for? Kind of setting up all that stuff. And, um, you know, if it's a band situation, you know, sure, I, I might do some pre-production or some pre-demos, um, work through the material with the band. Um, if it's, uh, you know, if we're hiring all professional session players and, it would just be the matter of kind of sitting down with the artist and working through the arrangement, writing it down, making sure that we're solid on it. So that way the charts that we give to the, uh, to the players uh, translate well and that they're able to, to kind of pick it up real fast. But, but that's what I would consider probably the pre-production process. Nice. I like, I like how you had the sort of two flavors of pre-production recording in there. The one that's just sing at your computer or sing and play at your iPhone or, a boom box or whatever and, and have none of the pressure of mic placement, gain structure, any of that stuff. Like just sit down and make art and then, you know, and take your brain out of it. Just do your thing and then give it to somebody else. You know, that, that relief thinker, you know, get somebody with a fresh perspective to think about it. And uh, I like too how you talk about doing a little bit of pre-production recording. Uh, we talked a little bit about that with Brian too, about um, being sort of in the role as producer and engineer you sort of got the advantage because you don't have to come up with a, a language. You know, I've, I've talked to some producers who don't engineer and they're like, you know, I, I got this guy and I use him all the time. Like I won't mix with anybody else. Cause we talk to, you know, like they'll say things to each other that, that really mean very specific things. You know, like, oh, uh, it sounds dusty, put some points on it. And that means, you know, <laughs> take out 1.5 K turn up a little three K, you know, but they, and they, they've worked out that language. So like being one guy in that situation, you know, like you can be, thinking about song structure, uh, instrument tonality, mic placement, plugins, outboard gear, whatever, uh, just all in one swoosh, which you know, I, I would assume sometimes can get to be kind of overwhelming. But um, I think that's the reason that a lot of people, besides just money, you know, they go to a, a smaller, you know, air quotes, project studio or producer studio um, just because of the workflow, it's it's smooth. You know, you you get in with a guy, and you got to find a guy that that's easy to work with and you like, and that that gets your stuff. But once you're in there, a guy like you has got to be like gold to a musician who can who can uh, you know say, all right, don't worry about the tech, I got it. Uh, you know, songwriting, we'll we'll get in there, and we'll figure it out together. Structure, cordage, key chain, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so just it's cool to hear how you go through that process. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A couple of like more technical things. Um, once you get into the the tracking and stuff, uh, you know, once you got your tracks pretty well down, how far do you go with the mix process? Like, do you mix your own projects? Do you shop them out? And what about mastering? Um, it really is based on a per project um, thing. There, there are some artists that we've worked with that that we've mixed, and then there's other projects that we've sent to uh, outside mixing engineer for for different reasons. Um, Usually, a lot of that stuff we usually try to talk about early on in the process um, based on what the goals of the project are. Um, you know, here in Nashville, one of the beautiful things is, is that there are so many great resources here and, and there's so much access to gear and talent. Um, any player you can think of, we can get. Any style of mixer we can find. There's some great mastering guys that are that are all basically in the state of Tennessee or in this city. And, and, and so it's, it's, that's one thing that you, you know, you kind of start to take it for granted here because, because there are, there's such a pool of talent. Um, you know, there's, there's a few mixing guys that we've used here um, and they all do different things and they all have different strengths and they all, you know, and so, so, and even beyond just the mixer, I, I would even say that carries over into like the players and into even the studios that you rent is that you start to kind of figure out what what rooms work for what styles and what players work for what styles. And, you know, as you're putting together kind of your production and your budget, you're starting to say, oh, man, you know, I really want to get this guy on drums for this song because he's going to he's going to really have a good sensibility for this or or i really want to get this guy to mix this um project because i think he's going to have a good a good perspective on on what they're trying to get and and you kind of start to learn that stuff and, and you start plugging people in it's kind of like fantasy football only like you know not sports <laughs> that's killer <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool 
<coughs> Sorry, the cough medicine is making me a little bit punchy. Um, cool. Well, let's get into gear a little bit. Um, and you gave us sort of a basic uh, description. Um, are you are you working sort of mostly in the box these days, or, or like is that sort of what you do in one space and in another studio? Are you get getting into like a big old analog console. Uh, do you work on tape at all anymore? Not really. I mean, I had a tape machine in New York, and it kind of followed me down here. And and honestly, we never used it. And and it's a, kind of a bummer because the few, the handful of times that I did use the tape machine, it is awesome. Like it sounds great, and there is something that tape does that nothing else does. But the thing that he does is like incrementally. It's like with it's like you have to kind of look at the 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 hassle to sound ratio of like <laughs> okay, like. Yeah, it's awesome, but this is what we have to do, and this is how much it's going to cost, and this is what the maintenance is going to be for it in order for it to be of the quality we need. And so it just starts to outweigh itself. And so, so, and generally, I mean, there aren't a lot of guys using tape. I mean, yeah, sure, there's a couple really artsy records that are coming out. And you'll read about it in Tape Op, and they talk about how they use the clasp machine, and it was right. so rad. But at the end of the day, like, it's only really, it's, it's only cool to the people who recognize how cool that is, if that makes sense. Right. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of, it, it's definitely a, I would say that tape at this point is definitely a more artistic decision than a technical one. Right. And I, for one, I, I would rather come up with, you know, I, I started out working on tape. Um, I actually worked on analog tape, ADAT, and Pro Tools, just back and forth, back and forth for different wow. things I was doing when I was in college. So, cool time to be around. Um, really frustrating gear wise, because, like, Anyway, um, but like having well, having learned that, like what I what I would say is like, all right, like why would I want to do a twenty four? Why would I want to try and do a forty eight track project on tape and run it off and sync and all this stuff when really what I want is some kick ass saturation on the lead guitar and the vocal and maybe the kick drum. And so then like I remember how like my Otaris used to behave and I can listen and hear how a Studer behaved because you can get your hands on master tracks and listen to you know Roger Taylor's kick drum or John Bonham's kick drum like oh that's what tape does to kick drums so okay now I'll find some saturation or you know and, and knock some top off in a manner becoming of tape and then I don't have to deal with 48 channels of tape hiss I just have the awesome on these three channels and everything else is you know digital pure and off you go yeah but nowadays honestly there's so many there's so much technology that that is available I mean there's this new uh there's Steven Slate just put out these new plugins that like mimic the sound of different analog desks and and they're pretty it's pretty awesome sounding. There's like a I know that there's um you know Steven Massey make, makes a plugin that kind of gives you a tape saturation thing and Digidesign came out with this heat uh option for pro tools that yep. that kind of allows you to saturate tracks um uh, I think uh Crane Song had the Phoenix plug in. And so so there's 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 digital options now that allow you to kind of like find those types of organic print you know uh characteristics. Um and so it's a lot easier to kind of get the sounds that you're looking for, but but it's also just a different medium. I and and I think it's also a different it's a different age. People are looking for things faster. Like like efficiency has become a lot more important in the studio environment than it was even 15, 20 years ago. I mean, you could sit around and think about it all day and nobody cared who was looking at the clock or the, or the budget, you know, and, uh, and that was considered artistic expression or, or whatever. Um, but nowadays it's kind of like, I mean, labels and, and artists and people who are spending real money to make real work records, they, they want to know that their money is, is, is being spent wisely and that the time that they're buying with that money is, is spent, um, efficiently. And so, so there is a benefit like we're at, right now to answer your original question, we are working in a system that is primarily in the box. Um, when we mix, we do sometimes go out to some, uh, analog outboard gear just because there's some there's some qualities to to that that a plugin can emulate but nine oh, yeah. times out of we're just printing back in anyways like and so you know like we we just mixed a project a, a few weeks ago and and we used some distressors on some drums and some bass and so we just kind of got the settings we want and then we just printed those sounds back into the track on a new playlist and then just rolled with it so that way we weren't hogging the processing and so so i think that Primarily, yes, we're in the box, um, 
and 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 a lot of people that we meet here in town, a lot of them are are in the box as well, or at least in a hybrid sense in the box. There's there's a couple guys that we know that do sort of stem out to a console, but even then the stems are pretty broad. Like you know, it's like oh, all the guitars are on like two faders or whatever. Yeah. So so it's it's you're starting to see that people are are leaning a little bit more towards the DAW as 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 being you know a legitimate environment to to create and to mix in. Yeah, it really can be your console now. Like you don't necessarily have to have you know a big chunk of analog gear with faders on it to get work done and and done really well. Do you use any uh any fader or rotary, you know, those little control surfaces when you mix? Not here. Um there's a couple rooms that we do some tracking in that have control surfaces, but but I mean I think me and and Brandon both kind of we're actually a little bit more efficient and a little faster just working with the mouse and keyboard just because we that's what we have here. Yeah, that's that's what I hear from a lot of guys. The only thing I the only reservation I had about this and I didn't even realize I was doing it was uh I was mixing down something last Christmas in the box, mouse mixing and I I made the mistake of looking at where a guitar solo started to wind up on a track and you know, so I drew in my little curve. And then listening back to it, I was like, man, if I was mixing that at the desk, in fact, I remembered mixing it at the desk because it was a recording of a live event. I waited for a vocal line to finish before I let my left hand ride that solo up. So that I, I mean, I still, I haven't gotten around to getting a hold of any faders or knobs or anything, but um, I just try to think a little more organically when I'm doing stuff like that. Like, how would I mix this if I was standing in front of a house somewhere? Or, you know, how would I want to hear this if I was sitting down listening to it rather than sitting here sweating over it? Yeah. Uh, cool, man. Um, to talk gear just a little bit more, uh, have you got one or even a couple? Uh, what's something that you just absolutely couldn't live without in the studio? Uh, distressor. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I remember. I think yours were the first one I ever saw. I love those boxes. So yeah, I mean, and, and it's not because it's like particular. I mean, there's definitely some gear that I would say is more awesome than a distressor, but but just based on its its application and usefulness, it's like it's like kind of like the desert island piece of equipment. Like if I'm gonna be stuck somewhere, I hope there's a distressor there. <laughs> um, just just because I think it it it. It is technical and artistic at the same time. Like it, it's a very precision instrument. It allows you to dial in um, very specific amounts of gain reduction and, and very specific attack and release times. And you can get very clinical with it. But at the same time, there are some options on it that allows it to be very um, a little bit more artistic and, and kind of give you an effect, you know, in, in some instances. And so. Um, I think it's a real versatile piece. I, I don't. I, I don't know. I, I can't ever really see working without one. I remember Alex. I remember you and Brian talking somewhere about that. About I think it was shortly after you got. You have the ones with a nuke button on it. I do, and yeah, I do. I have the ones that have the Brit mod and the nuke and everything. Yeah, right. I remember you talk. You and Brian going. Uh, this was a different Brian, a record company friend of ours that uh, used to collaborate with a lot, like talking about how much you crushed something with the oh, distress. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, dude, I took those audience mic and I crushed them, bro. It was rad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then it's like the whole, like, we used to have those, like, what's better than one distressor? Two distressors. Yeah. Now what's you can get two distressors. A rack of distressors. <laughs> right. Now they come two to a box. Right. If your wallet's that fat. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But no, it's a great it's a great piece, and and I mean, like I said, there's there's probably cooler pieces of gear out there that 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 we like to use, but but I think the distressor is kind of it's kind of a mainstay. It's always going to be around. Mm -hmm. um, plug in wise, are you like a, a total pro or a plug in hog? Like like you just got a vast library, or do you tend to keep things a little more pared down and, and kind of pick and choose a little bit? Um, I don't know. I. I, I if you had asked me that question two years ago, I would have said I don't really lean on the plugins that much. But I think in the last two years, I've I've kind of um, I've learned to kind of get into some specific plugins a bit more. Um, is there anything specific that you're curious about? I it's hard because that's kind of a vast question. Um, well, uh, 
not specifically. Like, I'm not super familiar with plugins. Like, I use this little open source DAW called Reaper, and it came with a handful of plugins. And except for like the reverb sucks, but everything else, you know, like the compressor's not a world class compressor. But I'm not working on world class material, so like, you know, it's a good enough compressor for what I do. I'm not out there seeking, you know, like, uh, you know, the latest LA2A modeled plugin or the latest Neve circuit plugin or whatever. So I'm just I'm for my own benefit, just kind of trying to find out, you know, like. You know, does somebody have this like, oh, this 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 is the most awesome plugin ever? Or like, I use this on every channel. Or like, when I really need the juice box, this is the one I go to. Uh, so I, and yeah, nothing really specific. I'm just kind of fishing around for some knowledge on plugins. Yeah, I mean, software is sort of a weird. It's it, it, it's I have a love hate relationship with software because I I I still don't think that the industry has really come up with a realistic way of justifying what a piece of software is worth. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, for instance, it's like you have like waves plugins that like an entire bundle is worth like 13 grand, you know? And it's like, well, is it really worth 13 grand? Like, you know, but then you have other guys who like Steven Massey, who like his, his stuff is offered at such a great discount that you're like, you almost wish he was charging you a little bit more for, for how great his stuff is. I got to start looking at his stuff up. That's, that's one of the things that kind of bugs me about it is like, you know, my soundcraft isn't getting a lot of use right now, but it's not going to stop working with the next OS upgrade. You know, like right. even 20 years down the road, like I can clean the pots and replace the caps and the sucker will still pass pretty good audio, you know? So like, and that's actually, that is a huge issue. I actually think that you're kind of touching on a huge issue with software and software rights and, and how software is, is licensed. And, you know, I mean, we've been, and, and I'm sure that there are users of your blog that have been through it with, um, specific companies and, you know, they come out with a new version and it's like, okay, there's a new, the OS is new. And so the, because the OS is new, then the DAW has to come out with a new version. Well, the DAW comes out with a new version and then the software manufacturers all have to come up with a new version. And of course, all of these people in the chain want to charge you more money for these new updates. And like you said, it's like when you buy a piece of gear, you want to buy the piece of gear one time. You don't want to keep buying the piece of gear over the course of a decade or whatever. And that was the, I mean, Pro Tools was really cool, but that's the reason I never bought it. Like it, at first, I didn't use it that much. So like it was going to be a huge jump. All right, buy a Mac, buy this thing, get the interface, get the whatever. And then probably just about the time that I had that complete, Pro Tools, you know, like whatever whole number, you know, next would come out. And, and there's Digi with their hand out like, hey, give us a thousand bucks. By the way, your old interface doesn't work and neither does that Mac. So it's like, right. what the heck? And there's, like, and there's two sides to it because it's like, I understand that there's R&D that needs to go into that and that these companies are spending tons of money in development and they're they're trying to keep up and there's it's a very competitive market. And so that money has to come from somewhere. And so I under I yeah I see both sides of it and I'm not in any way am I saying that you know it, it it's it's not fair on one side or the other it's more of I feel like the industry really needs to really needs to address it in a productive way not in a I think with this whole like you know with with pirating software and illegal downloading and and IP rights and all this crazy stuff that's going on we're kind of all missing the point like I think if we all just sit down and talk about all right well what's what are the practical needs of the user and the developer and let's talk about what those are and come to come in the middle here and come up with something that is a responsible and and productive way of dealing with this issue you know what I mean yeah and and I haven't really seen that happen yet I'm hoping that I'm hoping that that can happen but you know well it's I, I companies know. anymore have to pay pretty close attention to their end users and you know for pro for well it's avid now i, I still call them digi because uh, whatever long story it's been a long been a long road with me and well, pro tools die hard. Yeah. yeah um but you know the when pro tools came in like they were the cheap option like even if you weren't in the digital realm think about it if you had a 24 track room you had a Studer sitting there or a 3M or whatever. You know, you had a giant tape machine that wasn't just the expense of buying it. It was the expense of maintaining it, feeding it tape all the time, uh, and and the expense, the time you had to put in to, uh, oh, what's the term? You had to tweak it every time you used it and, uh, you know, get it all centered, aligning. You had to align the thing all the time. So it, it, to go from, you know, dozens, you know, tens and tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to get one room up, suddenly, you know, the paper boy has a Pro Tools rig on his MacBook in his bedroom, and he's blazing tracks. Um, because they have such a wide disparity, I mean, yeah, they have to keep going and keep getting bigger and bigger for, like, Hollywood movies that have 800 tracks and hit records that have 100 and some tracks. Uh, you know, but those their email addresses are just as open to, 
the paper boy who's you know making dubstep in his bedroom on Pro Tools now on, on LE or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's happening. And you know, like I was, I make those complaints. You know, like I like I did anything with Pro Tools. Like twice a year, I would record some garage band and and you know mix down on my buddy's LE system or whatever. Um, the cool thing now though is that. Uh, like things are starting to really diversify, you know. I mean, you've got uh, you know, Cubase is still really strong, Nuendo, uh, although for different things, you know. Like if you're kind of a MIDI synth guy, like that's Cubase. Um, Logic again, like really good for songwriters, not so great for doing audio. But you know, if you're a songwriter doing a bunch of stuff with synths or plugging in your own instruments, and you're just going to finish up with some audio, like I would want to try and make a record in Logic, but you sure can, and it's cheap and easy and you know if all of a sudden everybody starts migrating you know like if reaper for instance suddenly hits critical mass and everybody's buying it then pro tools is going to have to shake it up and uh anyway i'll i'll digress from that a little bit um you said something that that reminded me of uh something that actually i don't think i did get to ask brian how does it influence your uh well really I, how does it influence you in general like your your mix philosophy your production philosophy uh buying gear and setting up sessions when you know that the end result is going to be an iPod, that it's going to be a, an MP3 basically download from iTunes and uh, heard on some buds somewhere. I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, it's hard because in Nashville, the community in Nashville is there, – there are – I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to say this in, in, in a way. I don't mean this to offend people, but, but it's like there are a lot – there. what I would consider the professional engineer and the professional producer exists still very heavily here in Nashville. And, and there, are pe- there are people who really appreciate the art and the craft of, of engineering um, and, and creating a, a high-fidelity product, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that it's, it's at least in Nashville, you know, yeah, sure. Everything's going to end up on an iPod or, or listening through MacBook speakers. But, but I think the main consensus here is that, that we all still want to believe that people really want to still buy a pair of nice Bose or audio technica headphones and want to sit in their easy chair and enjoy a record. And, and I know that that isn't, common and i actually think that's kind of idealistic in its principle but but i think there's still there's still a value for the craft there's still a value for the art and 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 i think that that if we lose sight of that if we lose connection with that i i kind of i guess i'm a little nervous of what the future of art or the future of 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 record of the recording arts would be if, if we could kind of disconnect ourselves from the craft, you know what I mean? And, and it, and it all just becomes, you know, dudes in their bedroom making, but dubstep, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's great that the access is there and people, more people than ever have the ability to create, but, but I think there's an appreciation for the art of creating um, audio here that, that you don't find in, you know, a small town in the middle of upstate New York or in the Midwest, you know, um, where for them it's like, Hey, I've got pro tools and it's just like, (laughs) awesome. You know? (laughs) So, so I don't know. That's such a, it's a heat. That's a multidimensional question because it's like, there are certain aspects to that, that I think are really great. And there's certain aspects to that, that I think are really awful. And, and and there's no getting around any, any of them because it's evolution. It's, 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 it's progress. It's the whole thing's moving forward and there's no way to stop it. And, and you can't resist the change, but at the same point, it's like, while not resisting the change, you hope that the, the principles and the, 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 the art and the, um, the respect for, for the craft of audio would, would maintain if that, I hope that makes sense. Oh, that was, that was nicely put. If it would fit on a shirt, I would wear it. <laughs> but it's cool to hear you say that. And I was, I was thinking about this while I was driving the other day. Um, you know, the fact that anybody can sit down and make something like it's – and pop music has sort of always been like this. I mean, you know, if you go back to the days of Motown where there were some really iconic recordings, um, you know, like any, any genre in any time period, like the stuff that's really great is going to hold up. But really in the pop music venue what, and whatever – 
subgenre of pop music you look at, like really the most important thing about pop music is just that it's different. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be not what was going on last week. And, you know, so that, and that leads to the whole machine. Um, but on the other side, too, um, you know, there are always going to be people who just aren't going to buy into that. They're going to look for something that, all right, maybe it's not as well produced, but I mean, Think back to the days when we were in high school. I mean, I would listen to the Red Hot Chili Peppers on Walkman headphones through a megaphone just to hear that hook on Give It Away Now or, you know, like 13th generation tape copies of stuff that right. got played on the college radio station. So, And that just that goes to the heart of the music is, is that if the material is compelling, people are willing to. I mean, gosh, we listen to everything on cassette and, and MP3 blows that out of the water. Uh, but just I don't know, cool to hear a guy stand up for the hi-fi basically you know to you know that to say that all right if you as an artist are going to put your heart and soul into writing this stuff i'm going to do the same technologically so that you know should somebody sit down with a magnifying glass and really go over this you know they're going to find the hand stitching and uh you know the hand-tooled leather in there they're each corinthian leather yeah and don't get me wrong either john i mean it, it, there's there's I'm not saying that everyone needs to strive to be George Massenberg. I'm, I'm just really <laughs> like, I, I think because the other thing you have to understand is that every great innovation in audio, like when you look back at, at different kind of big pushes um, where, where either a certain technology or a certain sound was, was really prevalent in popular music. It was all driven by people who were taking things that already existed, a technology that already existed and using it in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. Right. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think it's amazing to me that, you know, when you start reading the story about auto tune and the fact that, you know, auto tune came from a, a, a sonar, a sonogram process that they were trying to, uh, they were trying to find like pockets of oil on the sea floor. You know, it's like this, 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 this computer program that basically analyzed sound waves bouncing off the seafloor. And they were able to manipulate that to create a process that would be able to tune a person's vocal. I, I think that's fascinating to me because it's like, here's this thing that what was kind of derived out of something that it totally wasn't intended to be used for. Um, you know, the same thing with like, uh, you know, uh, you know, we talk about, um, you know, these synths that they're, they're starting to kind of like take them apart. What, what is that called? That process? Uh, granular synths? No, it's, um, oh gosh, circuit bending, you know, oh, yeah. guys who take, you know, they take these synthesizers and they, 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 they mash them up and they, they make them sound like un unworldly, you know, but, but it's like, they're taking a technology that already existed and they're, they're basically twisting it around to make it into something artistically new and different. Um, you know, people used to do it with tape all the time, you know, it's like, Hey, let's, let's flip the reels over and see what happens when we record and then flip it back. And we got this crazy, you know, reverse reverb sound, you know, it, it's like people taking the technology and making it into something that it wasn't intended for. Those are the things, those are the innovations that inspire. Those are the things, I mean, listen to any radio head record. And I mean, that that's kind of the thing you're getting is like, these guys are taking technology that already exists and they're, they're, they're making it into something that has a new spin on it. And, and I think that that will always be there. And so, so don't hear me wrong when I say that the, the high fidelity and, and the, that there are rules. I'm not saying that there are rules. I'm just saying that there's a craft. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the craft needs to be maintained, even, even though we're, we're taking things and we're, we're changing their purposes. I still think that there's a value to the craft. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. And I was uh, just to add on to what you just said, you know, guys like you and I are called engineers because decades before us, you know, our audio forefathers really were engineers. I mean, those were the guys with the horn rim grass glasses and the white lab coats at RCA, um, you know, figuring out audio signal chains for the very first time. And then you know, like, I don't know how many devices you look into. I mean, I, I click around on Wikipedia a lot, uh, you know, like the first sentence of all these articles on audio gear is like, well, this technology started off with Bell Systems, which developed for, you know, long distance telephone communications 80 years ago. Like, whoa. So, you know, you look at balanced audio, phantom power, vocoders, uh, digital audio period is from the phone company. So right. uh, just so cool how, how all of that stuff uh, bends and morphs and get, does get used in different ways. Um, speaking of which, uh, one of the questions I like to ask people, and I may be putting you a little bit on the spot with this, so uh if you don't come up with anything right away, we'll, we'll move on. We can come back to it. But uh, what uh, have you got any just 
goofy tricks that you've ever done or stuff that you did by accident that turned out to be a happy accident and it was really cool and you printed it, you know, went and used it on the record? Um, you know, anything, anything at all. I, uh, I got some old <laughs> stories, but I don't know if I have anything recent. I'd love to tell you something more recent. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that. Well, maybe we can get you to do a blog post or have you back on. What, what do you got from back in the day? Because, I mean, you know, are you, are, is it like ADAT days or tape well, yeah, days? Well, yeah, ADAT. Like, ADAT was sort of the – everybody hates ADAT. You know, we all talk about ADAT like it was like that – it was like that um, – like it was the 80s or something, you know? <laughs> Or your mother-in-law? Yeah, like I, I think – or like a bad girlfriend, you know. I think ADAT was sort of like – I actually liked ADAT. I didn't really have an issue with it. It was really the first – some of my first experiences working with audio was on ADAT. And, and you know, yeah, sure, it was it was quirky and it had that stupid little blinking light that was like supposed to tell you that you were like not tracking right. right. And, like, like, I I can't even remember now what it was called, but I remember back in the day just being like, oh, gosh. It's like to, it's trying to speak to me. I know it. Error 7. Remember Error 7? It was yeah. like the best thing ever. <laughs> so, all, this, all the little secret key presses that if you knew somebody from Elisa, say, oh, you know, I, yeah, when you boot up, hold down, you know, the arm tracks for, for 2 and 6 and also this, and that'll, you know, realign the, the head or whatever. And, like, and I mean, and, it, and it's like, I mean, the thing was a VCR. Yeah. I mean, like, like, let's face it. Let's yeah. not talk about it like it wasn't what it is. I mean, it was a VCR. <laughs> um, but but I, I think there were things about ADAT that were really helpful to me. And I think this is something that's missing nowadays is that because it was a tape-based format, you still had to look at it linearly. Like you couldn't you couldn't look at it in the physical like you can on a DAW. And so – you had to manage a lot of stuff in your mind and on track sheets and you were kind of writing everything down and you were kind of keeping track of how everything went. One, one situation, the story I have is I remember being in the studio and this was like in the mid nineties, we were working on ADAT and the, the, the guy in the band was like, Oh, like, I don't know if he had heard like, I don't know, some grunge band record that had the reverse vocal reverb effect on it. And he's like, I really want to get this effect on my voice. And I didn't have anything like that. I didn't know how to get that effect. I didn't know. I, I was literally like kind of like in my brain trying to figure out there's no plugins at this point. There's no there's no effect that's going to punch up the, hey, give me the reverse reverb sound. And I wasn't on a tape machine. So I, I wasn't on a traditional tape machine. You can't take the ADAT out and flip it over. Like, And so you're – you know, it kind of it, it caused a bit of a, a problem solving issue for me. And so I was like, all right, well, how am I going to get the sound for this guy? And so I went home that night and in the middle of the night, I remember waking up and being like, I know how to do it. <laughs> and I ran. I, I actually got out of bed and I looked under my bed and I dug through a bunch of stuff and I found my four track. Yeah. I, I brought the four track to the studio and I used one of the tracks on the four track. And I, because uh, we had a BRC for our ADATs, and I striped Simpty code on one track of the of the of the four of the cassette four track, so that I could sync it with, with you know with the ADAT. And then what I did was I recorded the vocal onto the onto the 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 four track, and then what I did was I flipped the tape over, and then I printed it back into the onto the ADAT. Or no, I didn't. I, what I did was I, I – yeah, I, I flipped the tape over and then on another track in the four track, I printed the reverb on the track backwards, bounced it to another track, and then I bounced it back to the ADAT. So that way it would still be in sync time-wise, but it would have the effect on it. And so I had a whole new track on the ADAT now at that point that had the reverse reverb track on it. But the process to get there was way more – intricate and way more problem solving kind of thing that you had to go through to get there. And so I think that's actually one of the things that now is sort of missing in, in pro audio and even in the kids that are learning it in college is that there's sort of this problem solving aspect to the process that is missing because when you are working on a linear um, system there were so many limitations that you had to overcome to make certain things happen. And now we just have, Oh, I want a reverse sound. Hey, look, there's the reverse plugin. And so we just hit reverse and all of a sudden it's backwards. You know, it kind of takes 
it takes a little bit of the fun out of it in a sense, you know, it takes a little, it definitely takes, there's, there's a creative problem solving brain thing that's sort of missing. I know I just what you're talking about. And, 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 and so I don't think, I think there's something that people, people from that era. And I don't, I'm not trying to say, I sound like such an old guy when I say this, because it's not like back when I was a kid, let me tell you about the time I was on an ADAC. Like, <laughs> kind of like, but at the same time, like anybody under the age of 35, you may as well have just been talking in Latin for the last five minutes, right? right they, because they've never had that kind of an experience. And so so I think that there is a value to that, you know, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Like I, I hear it, you know, I'm almost 20 years past it now, but like my experience learning how to cut audio on a four-track cassette machine and on two- and four-track Otari reel-to-reels, uh, all of the lessons that those taught me about you know, gain structure, saturation, uh, you know, how to... Like bouncing, who bounces anymore? You don't bounce anything. You got a million, a million billion tracks of everything in your laptop, and like, whatever. Yeah, yeah we'll enable ten more tracks, whatever. You know, and um, Duplicate track, boom, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and so that's, but you know, guys, guys, you know, engineers that are just monolithic in the industry. I mean, you look at the, you know, the guys that engineered the Beatles, like they were committing to one track, you know, drums, piano, bass, and reverb, you know like pretty much deciding how it was going to wind up on the album because they had to that was all they had and um technology was still limiting enough that you know if you're in a 16 track eight at room you you could bounce a lot more easily then but you just you had to bounce you had to make commitments early and so it made you think about and decide about you know you kind of got into that mixing head eventually like all right you know i'm happy with these drums now am i still going to be happy with these drums in two weeks when we do the final mix can i can i mix these drums right now and have it come out right for the final mix so yeah, it's just a, it's a whole different thought process now with, with disposable tracks, kind of not. And uh, anyway, <laughs> I want to sound like an old man too. Although I think we both probably have quite a few white whiskers in our beards. Um, so yeah, cool, cool story. <laughs> um, let's see here. I, we're we're getting close to the hour mark. I'm still uh, hosting wise. I got to try and hold things to about an hour just so I don't have to. I already have to obnoxiously compress things and go with a pretty low bit rate to be able to well, get stuff edit, in. honestly you can edit through some of this stuff if you want oh and, no dude this is all this is all gold I, I, everything you said has been fantastic i'm probably gonna listen to this three more three more times than i need to to publish it just so i can soak it all up um let's see what one last question and this is another doozy i mean this you could easily get we could go another hour just talking about this but uh how do you feel about uh now that we're supposedly coming out of the the economic slump or whatever um state of the music industry you know with the uh, uh, just all this stuff, digital rights management, online streaming. Uh, I, I don't, don't don't get too specific, but just you know, what's what's the health of the industry? Do you think we're we're close to kind of, or sort of in the process of finding our way through to a whole new paradigm? Uh, you know, big record companies and and all that stuff. Um, I'm gonna kind of I'm not sidestepping your question. I'm just. I'm going to say something that I think is relevant to probably a lot of the people listening to this in, in regards to the question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it doesn't matter what state the ec- what state the economy is in, and it doesn't matter what state the record business is in. Um, it doesn't really – like all of that stuff is inconsequential to the laws of being in a band or being an artist. And I feel like those laws have not changed over the course of however long. Preach brother. If, if you are an artist and you want to be successful, there is no one in this world that is going to be able to validate you the way that you feel like you should be validated. It's not going to be a record label. It's not going to be your fans. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be your hard work and dedication to your craft. And that will never change. And so you know, it seems it's so funny because, you know, I did this record label thing, you know, probably a decade ago now. And then I was in a band and we toured and did stuff. And then I've worked with countless bands since. And it doesn't seem like it's it doesn't seem like that principle ever changes. Like every artist comes to us and they want to know, well, what do I need to do to get on a label? What do I need to do to be successful? What do I need to do to get my song on the radio? What do I need to do to to get more fans? And the thing is, is that there is no substitute for hard work and sacrifice. If you are willing to do hard work and to make sacrifices, you will find success. It's not going to be from a record label or a manager 
or any of those things. Now, all of those things, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying that all of those things are resources. They're all things that are going to help you get to where you're going, but they're not the thing that's going to get you there. You are your own vehicle. Does that make sense? Somebody and in the so, back, say amen. And so, so, so if you believe in what you're doing, and, and I guess that's a, another kind of key principle, and this is where it gets a little bit more spiritual, is that like I can believe in an artist like, and I have done this. I have believed in artists like more than I've believed in anything in, in some instances. But if the artist doesn't believe in themselves, they're never going to get anywhere. I can believe in somebody all I want, but I don't have the power to make something happen. Only an artist has the ability to believe in themselves and to work hard and to make sacrifices and to be able to grasp their own path or forge their own way in this. And what's crazy is, is once an artist comes into a place where they are secure in who they are, they believe in what they're doing, they're, ma- they're, they're invested in their craft, they're, they're, they're creating excellent work, then all of a sudden you start seeing them playing more shows and creating more of a fan base. And all of a sudden, let Labels and management are interested in what's going on there because there's something exciting happening. And it's not because you called them. It's because they recognize that there's something great happening. And so you're probably going to have to cut right here because, like, I'm not (laughs) saying any of this how I wanted to say it. It's coming out great, though. Keep going. Makes sense. But I guess what I'm saying is that it's really important for people to understand that the industry doesn't make you happen. Like I think, and and I'm going to get, this is going to be really crazy stuff, but it's like American Idol. Like I really feel like American Idol is sort of like the industry's last ditch effort to try to brainwash the public into making them believe that they need a record label in order to make it happen. You need to win American Idol so that you can get a record deal so that everything can happen for you. And I don't think that's true at all. I think that all of that stuff is just a vehicle to get you to where you're going. It's not, it's not you. It's not your, they're going to make you into what they need you to be. They're not going to, you're, ah, that doesn't make any sense. Cut all that out. That didn't make any sense. Do you get what I'm saying, John? Like I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate this well, and I don't feel like I'm doing a very good job. Glorious. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, thanks for that contribution, and that, and the cool thing is, is that more and more it's becoming that you don't need a big record label, you don't need a huge contract. What you really need is somebody who just kind of understands the business. Like you need a friend who is copyright law savvy, or you know, hire a good copyright or a, you know, entertainment industry lawyer. Um, you know, or even just take some business courses yourself. Take a music business course. Get familiar with the stuff and look out for your own interests because if there's not a record label involved, they don't get a cut. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know the way it used to be. I mean, you look at the, the, the tiny cuts that artists got. I mean, only the, the biggest of the big were ever really going to get anywhere financially. You know, a lot, of, a lot of artists that were a lot bigger than you maybe thought they were were, like, just barely making their daily bread off of their craft um, because of the way things were structured. Now that some... Bigger artists like you know Radiohead or Louis C.K. have done some self-released stuff and not even put a set price on it. Um, that was like a big wake-up call. Like, oh wow, you know, if my stuff is good, which theirs is because they're world class. But if you know, if think of instead of having to sell you know a hundred thousand copies to be considered a success and to make any sort of money, you know, that would allow you to have some sort of quality of life for you and your family while you continue to write music, so you don't have to work construction or you know deliver pizzas or whatever. Um, to get to a point where, like, all right, what if the if being a success now is just selling one iTunes track to ten thousand Facebook friends, or you know, selling one I don't know, CDs even matter anymore? But you know, instead of making eight cents off of each of a million people, what if you could make ten bucks off fifty thousand people? You know, is that mortgage payments? Is that keeping the lights on? Is that getting you a new Stratocaster and a you know, or whatever you need to to be able to sit down comfortably and and not worry about putting bread on the table and make your art? I think it does, and that's that's what's really exciting to me about the industry is that it's it's kind of getting blown open from the bottom up, um, and that's actually a pretty good place to wrap it up. Uh, you got anything uh, anything to add in there? Last minute, Kev. No, just to encourage people to uh, ask questions, and and you can never you never stop learning. You never stop learning this stuff and so it's always great to keep asking questions and to keep 
kind of getting better at what you do and, and there's always room for growth and improvement. And so, uh, so yeah, don't give up. Just keep, keep, keep working at what you do and get better at it. Right on. All right. So anything we didn't cover this time, uh, I'm going to encourage Kevin to, we've been talking for a while about getting him writing for the blog. Uh, so start looking for some posts to pop up from him on all sorts of topics because he is what I like to call a Renaissance man, uh, musician, engineer, producer, writer, thinker of deep thoughts. He's all that. And, uh, so yeah, we're hoping to get him to contribute, hopefully have him back on the, the uh, podcast here again soon. And uh, I'd like to open the same door to you, dear listener. Uh, if you've got something you'd like to contribute, if you think we're dead wrong and you'd like to argue with us, get in touch. If you think we're right and you'd like to agree with us, get in touch. you got ideas for topics, uh, answers to questions, uh, questions you'd like us to answer, anything at all, really. Uh, we're open. We want things to just be conversational. So we're easy to find. Uh, do a Google search. Look us up on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you can find the blog page. Uh, if you found this, this podcast, uh, probably the address is located somewhere near it on the page you clicked on. Um, l- we would love to uh, have your contributions or collaborate with you in the form of uh, writing or interviewing or whatever else you got. So that is, uh, that's a good point to wrap it up. I think I can just about squeeze this in without having to uh, MP3 compress it totally into oblivion. So thanks, Kevin. Thanks so much. It's been way too long since you and I have spent an hour blabbing about the biz. Uh, and I, I hope to do it again real soon. Thanks, John. All right, man. I will be in touch, and uh, I'll call you later about that keyboard. Awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, man. See you, Kevin. All, All right, right. Thanks, everybody. That was the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast for this week. We'll see you in a week. Yeah. I don't know. Are you still there? Yeah, hang on one second. I didn't say any of that good.